Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast, our 201st episode of this particular podcast, is brought to you by SeatGeek. That's been our presenting sponsor the entire time. Find the best tickets for sporting events, music, wrestling, opera, whatever. I was in Boston last weekend trying to talk my family into going to the Bruins game, and I went on to SeatGeek, and I was shocked by how easy it was to find good tickets that I could not talk my family into going to get because nobody wanted to go to a hockey game. They all wanted to go to dinner. Uh, I should have picked a better family. I have SeatGeek on my phone. It's by far the easiest way to shop for the best tickets thanks to the revolutionary grading system. Buy and sell tickets and two taps on your phone. Everything fully guaranteed. To try it out, download the SeatGeek app today or go right to SeatGeek.com. And a quick reminder, Major League Baseball is back. The Ringer MLB show is playing for free on the TuneIn app for the month of April. Download the TuneIn app for free. Listen to Ben Lindbergh and Michael Bauman break down baseball's biggest stories. And as a bonus for Ringer listeners, the Ringer Podcast Network has partnered with TuneIn to give baseball fans a free 60-day trial of TuneIn Premium to listen to every live home call from every MLB game around the league. Just go to TuneIn.com slash Ringer. And subscribe. You can catch the Ringer MLB show for free. And when you upgrade to TuneIn Premium, again, live MLB games. They ha- they talked about uh, Chris Stavinsky, who, did they have him on, Tate? I didn't listen to that yet. I was traveling. Yeah, Chris Stavinsky went on. Chris Stavinsky has been saving my fantasy team this year. Had him last year, too. Just a godsend. It's unbelievable. He'll just come in. I hope I'm not jinxing him, but he'll come in and he'll just throw three innings and have five strikeouts and not give up a hit. And it's just magnificent. I love that guy, but this is a really good baseball show. So listen to that. It comes back to the ringer podcast network in May. And we should mention speaking of podcasts, um, this is our 201st, but we passed 200 with Kurt Russell podcast on Friday, which was a really fun one to do. He showed up at 10 in the morning, just being Kurt Russell, talked to him about a whole bunch of stuff, but that was our, 200th BS podcast. We started this October 1st, 2015, the day my the day after my ESPN contract ended. And we have done 200 podcasts. Coincidentally or not so coincidentally, we have passed 100 million downloads for those 200 podcasts this week. So 200 podcasts, 100 million downloads. Thanks so much to everybody for spreading the word. It's funny, you, you can see the SoundCloud stats um, and most of the downloads and listeners and everything is from the United States. I would say it's like 85%. The number two country. What do you think the number two country is, Tate? Australia. No, Australia wasn't in the top five. Canada. Oh, wow. Canada's number two. <laughs> Shout out to Canada. My number two most popular uh, podcast country. So anyway, thanks for spreading the word. And thanks to all of our uh, sponsors and partners who have helped um helped us do this podcast and pay for the production and all kinds of stuff and thanks especially to sea geek who has been with us almost the entire time as a presenting sponsor i think for just about all of 2016 and uh 2017 as well so yeah 200 in the bank another 200 to come i hope uh we have we're gonna talk basketball this whole podcast we're gonna have a bunch of guests so stay tuned for that but first pearl jam All right, we are taping this. It is 9 o'clock West Coast time. So by the time we put this up, it'll be about 2 o'clock East Coast time. Just enough time for you to listen to a podcast for about five hours before there's three playoff <laughs> games tonight and everything changes. On the line is the ringer Robert, the ringer's Robert Mays, who is, uh, is a football guy for us, but also loves basketball and loves the Chicago Bulls and hated this team about as much as I think he's hated a Bulls team since I've known him. And now they're up 2 nothing in the first round over my beloved Boston Celtics. Rajon Rondo has turned the clock back to 2010. Jimmy Butler has, make, has made me regret not putting him on any of my all-NBA teams. Dwayne Wade looks somewhat Dwayne Wade-ish. Zipser's hitting threes. Portis is making shots. Mace, what the hell is going on? Hey, 
it is the most, it, it is simultaneously both the most surprising thing and the least surprising thing that's ever happened to me. Because <laughs> the, this team was so maddening and just for so long. And I knew coming into the season that was possible. You know, when they kind of constructed it, I was like, oh, God, this could be a disaster. And for a lot of it, it was. Then there's also that lingering thing of like, all right, like we've seen what Rondo's done in the playoffs. We know who, who Jimmy Butler is. And yeah, as soon as you didn't put him on the third team, I was like, God, I hope he goes off against the Celtics. It was <laughs> my little bit of vindication. Yeah. And then wait, you think about what Wade did last year in the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, it's for all the arguments against Wade, and there are many, the one that I think was relevant is that we are 12 months removed from him looking really good in the postseason. And even if he sleepwalks through 82 games, if he comes into this part, if they make the playoffs and he can make an impact, it's like, okay. I don't think any of those arguments were worth the way the team was built, but I'm still kind of enjoying it right now. Um, I went to game one, which was uh, a bizarre and emotional game and just strange. The energy yeah. was strange in the building. Isaiah's crying before the game. Nobody knew if he was going to play or not. Uh, guy came out, sang an unbelievable national anthem. Isaiah hits the three to go up nine six, I think, something like that. And timeout, the crowd goes just ballistic. Like there's such a release in the arena. And at that point, we're like, wow, Isaiah's going to play awesome. They're going to get through this and they'll win in five. I never in a million years thought that A, Fred Hoiberg would, would win a playoff series, and B, that this bizarre, goofy Bulls team was going to do anything. And then as that game went along, it's like, oh yeah, Rondo. Rondo's <laughs> Rondo's kind of looking like Rondo. <laughs> and then guys are making shots. And then, oh yeah, Dwayne Wade can do stuff. And then in the second half, Jimmy Butler just goes to another level. And then you start looking at it going, uh oh, they might have the best player in the series. And it's not on the Celtics. The guy I picked second team all NBA. Jimmy Butler, we have nobody to guard this guy. And you could feel the momentum going. I was not surprised at all by yesterday because the Celtics were favored by seven in game two. Did you know that? No, but I, that's the thing is I didn't know it was going to happen yesterday. Because of how wonky, wonky is the wrong word, because of how strange the circumstances and the climate was around game one, yeah. my thought was oh, maybe that it was just kind of a weird situation. You, know, you had this emotional high and then you crater a little bit because you got to that point and they'll come back in game two and everything will kind of normalize. And yeah. so watching what happened yesterday was just like, man, they just look better. And as much as I thought that there were elements of this team that could give the Celtics problems, the idea that they'd be better coached and just look better as a complete five-man or seven-man unit is just never something I considered. Yeah. I. Well, there's a couple guys on this Bulls team that just are the types of guys that give this particular Celtics team trouble. Like Lopez is somebody that yeah. Just the big physical guy who's always around the rim getting garbage rebounds. Like, that's a guy that the Celtics team is not really equipped to stop. Butler has size. And when you th look at the guys that have hurt the Celtics in the past, it's usually like those taller guys, like the 6'7, six, 6'8. Six, Butler's had success against them in the past. Wade has always killed Boston and has also injured some of our players. Like, there's a lot of history with him. But the, 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 the thing that's really that really changed the series, in my opinion, other than that the Celtics, when they can't make threes, are just an abominable playoff team. Like, they, they're they this team that's built around making threes, and when they don't make them, there's really not a plan B. But for Portis and uh, and, and Zipper, as my dad called them, <laughs> for those guys to be making, you know, just wide open shots, which I think was part of the Celtics' game plan. Yeah, let those guys shoot. Let Robin Lopez shoot. Great. Go ahead. Knock yourself out. For that to happen, it, it, the Bulls almost look unbeatable. Are you starting to get, like, if they get past Boston, which I would not count out Boston, but we'll talk about it in a second. Are you starting to get ideas? Because you play Washington in round two. It's not like Washington is the most invincible team either. It's hard to get ideas when I have two games of this and I had – I'm not saying 82 games of something else because they did play better down the stretch. Rondo played better. You know, I mean, Jimmy's just Jimmy, but I, I'm not starting to get that many ideas. Okay. I think that there's some elements that are specific to this series. The Lopez part of it is different when you're playing against teams that have bigger bodies that are better rebounding teams. But the other part of the Lopez equation that makes me a little bit more excited and gives me a little bit more hope is that the way they're moving defensively yeah. is pretty remarkable. 
I mean, he's been just showing and getting to the right spots. And you know Jimmy can play, and when a couple of those other guys are locked in, you know, they're capable. But what he's been able to be in the middle for them, I just didn't expect him to look like that at this high of a level of basketball. When we got to the playoffs, having him be the best version that I've seen of him in Chicago is not something I expect. I looked up your stats in March. I went into a self-loathing thing about this whole thing uh, last night about 1230 for about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> You, you were thirty one. You were thirty one and thirty, and then you lost nine of your next twelve, including like yep. seven of eight. Um, if you looked at the stats for the team, Lopez was like ten points and five rebounds a game for an entire month. For the mo- entire month of March, played all fourteen games. He's five <laughs> rebounds a game, and then you go into game one, and it, it looks like if if you brought an alien to go watch their first NBA game ever, they'd be like, "Is that the best center in the league?" So. You have that. The Butler thing, though, to me, he he does have this in him. I think for most of their problems were the fact that they were playing during the season, at least from what I saw, that they were playing every point guard other than Rondo and that the chemistry was way off. And yeah. am I crazy or does it look like the chemistry is better? Like I watched them in the press conference last night. The three guys were all sitting next to each other. Wade's making fun of the fact that he hated Rondo in the past and now he doesn't. Like... I just don't get it. I feel like my head was taken off my body and then put back on. Well, it's it's a couple of things. One, the chemistry just with the players in the court, I feel like, is better. And this is definitely revisionist history, but just the idea that now pretty much any four you're going to put out there is going to give you a little bit more spacing when you desperately needed it. And that's the problem. That's the problem, quote-unquote, with Taj Gibson being your starting power forward. Yeah. Is that I love Taj Gibson like with all of my soul. But when you have this group of guys around him, it's just really hard. It makes it difficult to do anything offensively. Right. So even though Miritich has been up and down, now that you have him and Portis, they're not they're worst NBA players in Taj Gibson, but they give you a necessary component. So you had that plus Rondo being the point guard. Okay, now I can see where how we can start cooking with gas and stretches offensively. But yeah. then the, the kind of the chemistry of the personalities. These are all dudes that just do not give a shit about the regular season. <laughs> right. I mean, Rondo could not care less. So the idea that there's actually some engagement from his end and Wade's the same way, I don't know. It just, again, this is all like, of course I'm thinking this way and I'm looking at it this way because it's going well. It, it doesn't make any sense really, but I guess I could see it like a far off reality that this was out there. I went to see the Warriors and the Bulls right but right after the trade deadline when we did the first Durant podcast, and it was just comedy. Like, they were such a mess. Meritich looked like he was trying to throw the game. It looked like he had bet on the Warriors. I mean, he, he just didn't want to didn't want to be there and, and was just full of hate. They were playing Michael Carter-Williams. They were playing Grant. They're playing everybody but Rondo, and then every time Rondo came in, the team would settle down and they would look good. And and you know, we after the game, I remember driving home with Tate and Tommy, and we would be like, "Why don't they just play Rondo?" Lopez was playing hard, Gibson was playing hard, but he, as you said, um, now that he's not there, the spacing's just better, and there's more room to operate and and do everything. And uh, the one thing, as I was watching that game, and this is what I can't reconcile with this playoff series. I just think Fred Hoiberg is a terrible coach. And yet you watch these playoff series and he's out coaching Brad Stevens. The Bulls look totally prepared. My dad and I were walking home after game one and we're looking at each other like, wow, Stevens got out coached. Hoiberg, the Bulls knew everything the Celtics were going to do offensively. And then on the other side, the Bulls were just doing their thing. And it was like, wow, where, where did this come from? Did you see any sign of Fred Hoiberg being able to do this? No. And, and I'm trying to figure it out. I was thinking about it this morning. I was like, well, they're long and athletic, and if they start carrying on defense, and you have a Celtics team that you know, is really built on ball movement, so if you know where the ball is going and there's less improvisation, maybe you can kind of figure out what the next steps are. And again, this is all just rationalization in my mind, but I need to rationalize it because it's so weird to see. It, it, I did not expect it whatsoever. Jason Concepcion has joined us. Good morning. Hey, buddy. He doesn't know... Really, what it's like to have your team surprise you in the playoffs since no. it's only happened like two times in the last in the century for him? Yeah, 
It's been, uh, geez, 18 years or something like that? <laughs> there's, there's children who, are, who can fight in wars now that are alive since the last time I heard it. Jason, you... Uh, the worst part a... about this for Knicks fans is that this is now the nail in the coffin of the Bulls winning to Derrick Rose. Tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's another it loss really for Knicks is. fans. It really is. Uh, Robin Lopez looks like Shaq. Jason, you, you're an innocent bystander. Yeah. You, don't, you don't care about the Bulls or the Celtics. It's true. You're watching this, so it's, it's like just give us the the detached perspective of somebody who can't believe that this is the Bulls. Uh, well, I mean, you know, it's like it's they're they're the kryptonite for the Celtics in a, in a really weird way, where they just are soft around the rim and around the paint. And Robin Lopez is like a mutant beast who was bred to grab rebounds, and he's just destroying them inside, and it's crazy. And it's really, and it's also just, it's just bizarre. It's bizarre. So it's bizarre and it's not bizarre. It's yeah. not bizarre that the Celtics are losing a round one series because anyone who's, and I watched a ton of Celtics this year. I was so nervous about round one thinking they would play Miami, mm -hmm. who was basically on a 60 win pace the second half of the year. And I was like, that, that team's better than us. Like we have... It's Isaiah, and it's a house of cards. We can't rebound. It's this team that's built around shooting threes, and unless they shoot forty percent from three, they're right. kind of they're kind of hopeless. Unless Isaiah goes to another level, so not, that doesn't surprise me. But you know, the the X factor here is: would this have happened if Isaiah didn't have the family tragedy? That's, because that's he he was not. I know he put up stats in game one, but it wasn't yeah. the same guy, and it and it wasn't even him as much as. The team itself, you could just see it. Like they, yeah. they're consoling him throughout the game, and the energy was off. And it wasn't like they weren't in like this mode of we're fighting for our playoff lives. They were like, we feel bad for our buddy. His sister just died. Then you carry that over to game two, and Isaiah's terrible. He missed six free throws. Yeah. Like the guy shot ninety percent from yeah. Yeah. the line. He's just not the same. And it really exposes how limited the Celtics team is because at, during game one. I'm sitting next to my dad. I'm going, we got to put Gerald Green in. We need offense. Like, Gerald Green's a 13th man. This is not, that's not the answer. You know? So, I don't know, Maze. I, I think you should be feeling pretty good. On the other hand, from what you've seen from the Bulls all year, it's a team that could absolutely blow a 2 nothing lead. You wouldn't be surprised. I, I wouldn't be surprised, but just based on the way they played the last two games, it's not as if something fluky happened. It looks complete. And that's why I feel a little bit better about it. And seeing them confident. crater from wow. this would be shocking. I'm not, no, I trust me, they could happen. I just think it's not as if, you know, one shot went in or something, right. you know, something weird went on. I think the way they played is against this team is something they can keep doing. Bill, I want to ask you, though, because the Thomas thing is interesting. And I think that he's the guy, like, all right, we need a bucket. He can go get it. Yeah. And if he's off, do you buy into the Rondo understanding where the ball's going based on certain movements sort of thing? Because it does look like he knows what's going on. Yeah, I don't know if Fred Hoiberg just stepped his game up or Rondo and Wade have played are just so smart and Butler too. That in person in game one, I was shocked by how unconfident I was that the Celtics were gonna get a good shot. It just seemed like the yeah. Bulls knew everything they were gonna do. And you it's really hard to see that on T V. When you're watching, you're like, Shit, where do we go? It's like over and over again you had guys hoisting up bad shots with five seconds left in the shot clock. Then on the flip side the Bulls, both games, got great shots. Yeah. And if they missed the shot, they just got the rebound. So if you just look at, like, who had the better chances. Mace, do you think – I mean, it's far away. It's 2020. But do you think Fred Hoiberg is going to be the next Olympic coach? <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. I mean, I think whenever Coach K wants to step down. Because by that point, Fred will have what? 17, 18, 19. He'll have three rings. He'll have three rings. So he'll probably be the one that's the next logical option. I, I will say at this at the game, at game one, when they booed Rondo, the fans, and I was part of the crowd, so I should say we, I was not booing Rondo. Rondo, we won the title with Rondo. Rondo outplayed LeBron in 2010 in a playoff Great. series. Like, I get it. It's the playoffs. He's on the other team. But I just can't boo Rondo. I, I just wasn't in me. I love that guy. Even Rondo was like, I understand it. It hurt he my feelings. <laughs> Sports is sports is so cruel. It really is. But even Rondo, you know, Rondo, Rondo understands it. Rondo knows what's going on. Rondo's been around. He's like, yeah, I get the it. The things I'm that Rondo can actually get worked up about are very small. I don't think there are many of them. 
Yeah, well, like losing a Connect Four game right. and you know, exactly. like uh, yeah. his roller skates not being around. <laughs> <laughs> Explain to me how Rondo was probably the worst defensive point guard in the Ooh. league for four years. And now it looks like KG 2010 jump in the passing lanes up to stuff all the time, Rondo. Where where did this come from? It's not. It's what two games though. You know what? Yeah. I'm gonna need to see all the Bulls pee in a cup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna need blood tests and urine tests right. right now. Right now, I, although I don't need one from Wade because when he missed well, the dunk, I'm like, okay, that's good. That's he's getting old naturally. Wade, this is uh, Wade's known time of year for. Uh, you know, all of a sudden hitting shots and running harder than he's run in years. Would you call this the Rondo Sots? Uh, not yet. Let's w let's let them win the, the series first. Okay. Yeah. It's an official Rondo Sots when they win the, <laughs> yes. when they win the series. Yeah. I'm comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with that. Maze, last thing and then then we'll let you go so you can study the top two hundred offensive tackles in the NFL draft for another ten hours. Um <laughs> The Celtics never really had a chance to get Jimmy Butler, and it drives me crazy that I'm getting asked this. I'm getting emails about it. People are tweeting at me about it, like, "Oh, you guys, that's what happened. You guys should have gotten Butler or George." It's like, why, why don't we throw LeBron and Steph Curry and Russell Westbrook into that? They, oh yeah, we, you know, we, we should have gotten Russell Westbrook at the deadline. Like those guys weren't available. There was no Paul George trade. Larry Bird wouldn't call the Celtics back. Chicago wasn't trading Jimmy Butler. They were not doing anything. They were going to wait until the end of the end of the season to see what how the lottery shook out to see if the Lakers pick was going to be involved. Nobody was trading those guys, so you can't blame blame the Celtics for the fact that they decided Jonas Jerebko, Amir Johnson, Tyler Zeller, and Gerald Green were acceptable playoff bench guys. But don't blame them for not trading Jimmy Butler and Paul George or trading for them. It, well, that's the difference between having a conversation and having that conversation be rooted in reality, right? I, mm. I believe that the Bulls and Jimmy Butler, or the Bulls and Celtics, have talked about Jimmy Butler, but I, I also believe that pretty much every one of those conversations has involved the Bulls muting the phone, looking at each other, and being like, <laughs> "What is this guy's deal? Like, right. is he yeah. serious?" So, I mean, that's that's the difference. That's the gap there. I think the Celtics called up Chicago and said, "Hey, are you guys going to trade Jimmy Butler?" And they said, "No." And they're like, nothing, nothing, there's nothing we could offer. And the Bulls are like, no. And then that was the end of the conversation. That's not, that's not a trade talk. Those aren't trade talks. If I call, if I call somebody and, and offer to buy their house and they say, we like our house, we're not selling it. That doesn't mean we talked about buying their house. It kind of does. <laughs> if you call me and want to buy my house, now I know you want to buy my house. Yeah, but you didn't want to sell it. Yeah, that's true. I mean, but you can't blame me for being like, oh, he should have bought Jason's house. It's like, well, Jason told me he didn't want to sell it. How much of this, though, is, is also like post we didn't move the guy political kind of like smooth things over so he will play hard during the playoffs? Jimmy so, Butler? Yeah. Or either guy. You know, I think I think they would have been nuts to trade Jimmy Butler yeah. unless the Celtics were like, we'll give you our Brooklyn pick, we'll give you Jalen Brown, and we'll give you Jay Crowder. You know, something like that. Like if we're gonna the give Brooklyn you... pick was not involved, it's a no go. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's, the, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. If you called and, and, and if you called and said, "I want to buy your house," I'll give you three dollars for it. <laughs> somebody would say it's not for sale. The Brooklyn pick has to be there, or or the phone gets hung up so hard that it breaks in half. Wait, may I stay that's on the exactly my understanding of it. May I stay on the line for one second. We're gonna talk about okay. my friends at Harris dot com. Mays, you should. Really have Harris dot com because after we saw your beard in the Mori Ball trailer, <laughs> I think you need a razor more than anyone I know. They sent me some razors it's last gone. year. It's so sad. It's gone. Oh, you shaved it. I trimmed it off. It's all it's all gone. Well, I wish you had used Harris because if you're not using their state of the art German engineers, German engineered razors, I feel sorry for you at two dollars per blade. It's about half what you're paying at a drugstore on Harry's.com right now. My listeners can get themselves a free trial set that includes a weighted ergonomic handle, five precision engineered blades with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade, a rich lathering shave gel, a travel blade cover. And guess what? Harry's is so confident in the quality of their blades. They want you to try their shave set for free. You heard that right. Free. Cover a $3 shipping fee when you sign up. That's it. It's a $13 value for you to try. That's a special offer. For fans of the BS podcast, go to harrys.com slash BS right now. Redeem your free trial set. Just cover that chip in. That's harrys.com. Code BS. Maze, I want you to stay in line for this question here, Jason's answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. 
you're Jason's Jason's Phil Jackson. Oh, great. so so you're let's Congrats. pretend you're half a, asleep. Make the sound of a, a bong bubbling for yeah. about five minutes. <laughs> you might be a little high. You're half asleep, and you just want to blow things up. And I'm Danny Ainge, and I'm freaking out that my team just lost in round one to the to the uh, zombie bulls. And I'm like, I'll give you the Brooklyn pick right now for Porzingis. I'll give it to you right now. You can have it. I don't even know if we're going one, oh two, three, God. or four. Here's the pick. Phil just would give do us it. Porzingis. I feel like Phil would do it. And that's terrible. He would do it. I think he would too. He would do it. So here here are the benefits for it. <laughs> if let's say you get the number one pick. Sure. Sure. That person is now under contract for two extra years. Porzingis starting in about a year right you have to start worrying about him leaving and and running from the Knicks which any sane person would probably do cuz it's he's one of the worst running franchise. already yeah, he's, he's already running. started looking out over the <laughs> over the <laughs> seeing what's on over the distance there yeah maze is this a trade that on paper makes sense to you if you're the Knicks i don't here's the thing do you feel like the guys in this draft that would be the number 1 pick could they be the best player in a championship team? And do you think that Porzingis could be? Because if you're the Ooh, Knicks, you start over anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me let me flip that around. Uh, I do believe that some of the guys in this draft could be the best player in a championship team. And I think that Porzingis, his ceiling, uh, taking into account the the first part of his like developmental arc before this kind of stagnated season, I think... You know, he could be maybe the second best guy, like a, a Pippin type guy on on a championship team, like a, a highly qualified number two. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That said, that's kind of like the micro. The macro is this is bad process. You don't do this. You don't cut bait with a guy who is a who projects as even like a second tier star because he doesn't want to play a 1950s offense. You know, like and right. you're and and your president of your team is not even going to be there in two years and the nick new guy is going to just two change years. It. you know like well it's assuming he he lives out his extension oh yeah we talked about this in my office yesterday like, james dolan has this thing where he's like i made a deal with phil jackson yeah he i live up to my deals right. he has five right. years i saw i make a deal my word is the law and then it's like james dolan's had 15 people running madison square garden <laughs> yeah. he fires them every two years also an option is part of is part of a contract and you don't have to pick it up. No, you know, like you could, you could still have lived up to the contract and decline the option. Well, how about this? If if the Sixers trade Porzingis, take Porzingis at three, yeah. and you take Okafor at Ooh. four, the Phil Jackson era is even possibly worse than the Isaiah <laughs> Thomas era. Uh. At least Isaiah drafted a couple people, and I don't know. It, it's just bad. Like, you don't do this. You don't run a team this way. Whether you could actually get value for Porzingis in, in any number of situations, and I think in that situation, like, if you really want to look at it, maybe you do get value out of it. You don't know what these guys are going to be. You have, with Porzingis, you have a bird in the hand, so to speak. But it's just, you don't, this is not the way to run a team. You don't run a team by, by like, killing the trade value of your guys by burning a guy in the media with your friend's blog. And you know, <laughs> like this is not how you run a team. You don't do it like this. Yeah. Can you to imagine be fair to the Phil Jackson era though? There's yeah. no way to know it could have gone this bad. No one could have predicted this except I, for everybody. I, yeah, I, know. <laughs> I didn't think it would go. this. I remember, to be fair. I did not think it, it could go this badly. I remember I was on countdown that second year when they did this. Yeah. And I said on TV that I thought it was a mistake that I thought he was too old to just all of a sudden run a team that I couldn't imagine him like flying around all these different countries, scouting international prospects. <laughs> I didn't think he would put in full days and everybody got mad at me. Well, People were like, oh, he, he won six titles. Who are you? I mean, the issue really is he wants to coach, but he can't do it physically. So he's like coaching by proxy through a bunch of people. Yeah. And none of them want to run the triangle and he wants to make them run it. And it's, you know. The triangle is the most perplexing <laughs> thing of all of this. It's, it's almost, it's, I don't, what, Maze, what's the football equivalent if somebody was running like the, like the, uh, what's the, the wishbone? So they were yeah. under the wishbone. I mean, it, you probably have to go that far back. It's like something that existed in the late night or mid nineties. Oh, man, right. I mean, it, it's crazy. 
it, it, Phil was asked what he liked about Porzingis' game last season, and he said a bunch of things, but one of the things he said in part was he was proud of a game where KP didn't take a three because it's, quote, a cheap way to get baskets. Yeah, that he, should not have, <laughs> he shouldn't have a job. It's like, that is so, just, I mean, like, it's just brutal. You know what the other thing is? He's literally, I mean, I've written about this, but he's literally, if you created a stretch five from scratch, you would create Porzingis. I don't think you yeah. would change one aspect of who he is as a basketball he, player. He's like tailor-made to play the modern game. Yeah. And 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 yet Phil uh, can't appreciate this and in fact thinks that the way the game is played now is some kind of abomination and we need to turn the clock back on the way it used to be. All right, be. we'll throw in Jay Crowder. <laughs> Okay, Jay Crowder's like a guy. It's great the triangle. Jay Crowder's like the fortune cookies. Get gets thrown into just every gets passed deal. Around. Yeah, we'll throw in Jay Crowder, and that's a done deal. I, uh, I, I personally would not trade Porzingis unless it was for the first pick. I think Fultz has a chance to, yeah, maybe have a higher ceiling, and you get him for under contract for two more years. That to me is conceivable. But I think the ramifications that it would have on the Knicks fan base who love Porzingis. Uh, it would be brutal. And yeah. then if you look at the history of basketball, the worst, the trades that work out the worst for right. the team trade, any the, the young player, the young star, whatever, it's always circumstance and yes. not the trade itself. So it's like the Harden trade. They're arguing about a difference of like five million bucks. <laughs> right. And they ended up, they, they had all these other options. They just send them out. But you always want a Chris Webber. Um, Jason Kidd, you go through all the guys that have just been plucked from other teams at the wrong points of their career. It's always circumstance. And also throw throw out like whether it works or not. If if a trade should go down, let's say, and Porzingis uh, hurts his foot, like most like a lot of big guys do, and he doesn't have a good career, it's still bad process. Like. Don't right. run your team like this. Right. Make that, and that's what people say. Oh, look, he got injured. It's, yeah, but you don't, you know, like you can't run a team by being psychic and knowing guys are going to get injured in two years. Like you have to have a process and you have to stick to it and you have to, it has to be consistent or else you're just kind of throwing stuff against the wall and like hoping stuff happens. You can't run a team like this. If you played poker with Phil Jackson, you'd be like, <laughs> I have two threes. It's not good enough, but I think I'm going to go all in anyway. You'd be like, what? Be, why are you telling me your hand? He'd be like, uh, numbers are a social construct of uh, what does a number mean? The symbol three, what is, you know, is actually correlated to the number three, but that's not uh, tied into anything. That's what yeah. Phil. Maze, who do you think has more playoff wins since two thousand two? The New York Knicks or the Seattle SuperSonics? Oh, I love those early 2000 Sonics teams, so I'm just going with them. I mean, it, the Knicks have like two, don't they? Wins, game wins, or series wins? Playoff wins. Uh, yeah. You have seven playoff wins since 2002, and the Sonics have eight, and they folded their team in 2008 and moved to Oklahoma City. They've got one series win in, in 15 years, 16 years. That's Brian from bad. Washington, D.C. asks, here's a question from Brian from Washington, D.C. Is this lottery of the year the Knicks finally get lucky? No, because they already they lost yesterday. They lost the coin flip. To yeah, you Minnesota. went from six to seven. <laughs> <laughs> They've already lost. <laughs> the uh, Brad says seventeen years of James Dolan, zero luck in the lottery. Missed out on Curry by one pick. Missed out on Westbrook and Love by one and two picks. Blew the top spot in two thousand fifteen with two games to go that went to Towns. Um, and then he asks, but if they did win. Would Phil Jackson pass up Fultz and Ball and take a big man like Larry Market in anyway? Because he's Phil Jackson. Secretly, though, the Knicks have drafted well in the, relative to the positions that they've had. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, I can't wait to hear what this explanation is. I, they, they've drafted well. I mean, you look at the guy it, in the playoffs right now are a number of players, Channing Fry, uh, Nene, number of guys who the Knicks – drafted and then we're like ah we got to get some older broken down more highly paid guy that's the next move that's the next move they never develop these players so it's like they'll probably take somebody good and then they'll probably trade him for some old broken down guy for my law for my long gone hbo show after the second episode we did a whole thing heading into free agency about how the knicks were destined to sign dwight howard <laughs> that is the nixiest of knicks moves oh, yeah. and just their forty-five-year legacy of always yeah. ending up with the guy three to four years too late, and be great in, the, in the montage we left, we put Joakim Noah in there, like gotta cover our bases just in case they signed Noah instead. Phil and is, that's who they signed. At his end-of-year press conference, he said of 
Noah, he's 31. He's still relatively young. Yeah. He hasn't watched Joe, Joe Kim <laughs> He hasn't watched Joe Kim Noah play basketball in six years. You gotta check no, the, I, I guarantee you that. Check the odometer on that one. <laughs> Joe, Joe Kim Noah is a young 31, like uh, like Axl Rose was a young 31 during the Guns N' Roses tour. <laughs> Joe, Joe Kim Noah, ask anyone in Chicago who stayed out past two in the morning how old Joe Kim Noah was. Uh, he literally couldn't move last year. He couldn't move. He's like from point A to point B. It could have been three feet away. It was it's, incredible. It's very tough. The I other mean, weird thing about the Knicks, I can't believe we're talking this much about the Knicks, but it's it's so irresistible. <laughs> The weirdest mm-hmm. thing about them is they – I would argue that they have more fans mm. than just about anyone. Maybe – I think the Celtics and the Knicks, maybe the Lakers, but just when you talk about generations. Yeah. The Knicks have fans ranging from the age of 90 to the age of four. David Stern was famously – They also fan. have a lot of highly educated fans, yeah. people who understand basketball. The, the concept that they have to make splashy moves all yeah. the time – to, to kind of seduce the fan base. It's actually the opposite. Like if they had some sort of money ball, smart, build it up, Theo Epstein, Cubs type I'm getting, of I'm getting angry now. plan, all the Knicks fans would be like, that's great. This is what we should be doing. Look at it. All they got to do is look at Boston. Look at Boston. Yeah. It, it, in four years, they went from a complete teardown to the top seed in the in the playoffs. It's like right. the, the, con- the, the excuse is always uh, New York won't stand for a rebuild. And then three, four years down the line, if you had rebuilt, <laughs> look where you'd be. And they, you know, it's this is the trap that everybody falls into. They want to go be, at, at, to New York because if you win there, you you basically become a legend. And in order to do that, they get seduced into making these moves. Except the for LeBron. Season. LeBron was the oh, one he's person. Smart. That's why he's a smart guy. Well, you know what happened. Well, James Dolan rolled into the into the He had meeting. the free agent meeting. No, they, they wheeled in Donnie Walsh, who had just had some surgeries in a wheelchair. It's like Donnie Walsh in a wheelchair, James Dolan, and one other guy. And, Donnie did right by the Knicks. So. And then they go to Miami, and Pat Riley's just throwing his dick and his rings on the table <laughs> in that order. Here's my dick, and here are all my rings. Yeah. Boom. Right. And LeBron's like, ah, I want to play there. Uh, Maze, last question. Is it possible Danny Ainge knew that this was the destiny of the Celtics team and that's why he refused to give up any assets whatsoever at the trade deadline because he knew this was a house of cards and smoke and mirrors and basically a 500 team that Isaiah Thomas pulled 10 extra wins out of because he just was out of his mind? Watching this Celtics team for two games, is that possible? Well, I mean, we just discussed that the Jimmy Butler trades and Paul, Paul George trades may not have been on the table at all. But say those two guys are part of a package of them giving, us, giving up assets. You don't like that team? You don't think a Jimmy Butler, Isaiah Thomas, so whoever d- else Don't do this to me. It wasn't was possible. Move. Stop it. It wasn't going to happen. Look, they, right, so yeah, no, but they could have. those moves are off the table, then maybe. No, they could have gotten Serge Ibaka. They could have tried well, to I mean, get Nerlens Noel. That? They could have got. Well, let's say they gave up. You know, they could use the two guys they stashed for Serge Ibaka, and let's say they gave up uh, something else for Boyan Bogdanovich. (laughs) And yeah, I mean, the sad thing is, even Irian Ilasova would have been better than seven of the guys who played in these first two games. Turkish Kobe. Yeah. Anyway. All right, Nays. Look, I'm not happy for you. Uh, I feel no joy for you whatsoever. But it's all coming up maze, man. The, it's the fucking Cubs win maze. the World Series. The you, the uh, the Bulls are having a renaissance. The Bears have a QB. You got that is not Mike true. Glennon. The fact that you put that in the other two is just I'm insulted, and I know you're trying to make Mike me mad. Glennon. You got. I'm leaving now. It's all coming up Bears. Thanks, Maze. Sounds good, buddy. Talk to you later. All Peace. right. All right. Quick break to talk about properclot.com. Every guy knows that it's hard to find a dress shirt that fits. Maybe the collar's too tight, the sleeves are too long, the shirt's too loose. Well, I have some good news. Ordering a custom fit shirt has never been easier thanks to Proper Cloth. Create a custom shirt size in seconds by just answering 10 easy questions, no measuring required. Over 500 fabric styles to choose from. Everything from classic business to casual shirts. All high quality starting at just $85. Proper Cloth has hundreds of five-star reviews on Google and Yelp. It's the highest rated custom shirt maker on Google. Find out why GQ calls them their favorite online custom shirt maker. Go to their easy to use website, make a custom profile, even order from your phone. By the way, proper cloth guarantees a perfect fit. Remakes are free. 
The proper cloth team makes it super easy to do. Stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Look your best. Go to propercloth.com slash BS. Enter gift code BS to save $20 on your first shirt. Again, proper propercloth.com slash BS. Gift code BS. All right. So Jason Concepcion and I have worked together it's since true. the Grantland days. We were all infatuated by your uh, your Twitter account, <laughs> which was Network with a three. That's right. And I, after hearing enough conversations about it, I said to Chris Ryan, "Can we get that guy to write something for us?" And Chris Ryan did his whole yeah, 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 but never did anything. And then I got mad at him. And then it turned out you you had actually written a Nick's book. Who'd you write that with? Well, or you were working on a Nick's book. I, we found out you were actually really a writer. I had written a couple of things in a Nick's book about Jeremy Lin with a bunch of uh, fellow Nick's writers. So that's when, like, well, this guy, well, AKA he can write. Best... He can put paragraphs together. Sure. So what was the first thing you wrote for Grantland? The first, it was, it was some shoot around that I can't remember what it was. A shoot around post, so probably like a 400 word. And then you started thing. writing more and more? It's Yeah. And more and more? I'm still fooling people. Then you came people. to the ringer with us? That's right. We're here. And then we finally, as as the last chapter of our journey together... <laughs> <laughs> we made you move to LA and you actually did. You turned your back on the Knicks, which tough. I don't blame you. It was time to leave. It's we better to follow them from afar, I yeah. think, than, than have the energy be so close to your body and infecting you all the time. Yeah. You yeah. need to be 3,000 miles away. It's true. I got this email from somebody <laughs> that, that I haven't used in a mailbag yet, and I will, so I'm, I'm stepping on it. That's all right. He said he went, he Googled how old James Dolan was. Yeah. And James Dolan was like 61. Is that how old he is? It's dark. 61. And then his next Google was, what is the average expectancy <laughs> for a white male? And it was 79 years old. Uh, and he was like, I have 18 years left. It's so dark. The, the law, the loss, the law of Google and whatever and math just says, I probably have around 18 years left with Jim Dolan. Give or take a couple years. And he's like, do I just switch teams? What do I do? Why I'm are, sure you've actually you've gone down this path mentally at least. I have, a couple but I times, try right? not to because it's such a dark line of thought. You know what I mean? Well, but the line of thought of just <laughs> I'm stuck with this owner, and by the time he sells the team or something happens, I could be 60 years old. Here's here's like a here's a semi hot take. He's almost good, right? He's almost a good owner. He, okay. He's willing to write checks. He spends money. That's a major part of being I'd a like good this. owner. Keep it going. And he cares about winning. He cares mm. too much. As, as a matter of fact, he's the caring. It's like how OJ cared about Nicole. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. The caring overrides his impulse control. Okay. You know? And, you know, if you could just somehow. This is why I had hope for the film move because, uh, you know, as, as we have said, the Knicks' classic move is find us big name people who are old, you know, and like yeah. and just. <laughs> Whether so, they're players or executives. So the ultimate. The ultimate uh, peak of that philosophical path is Phil Jackson. They don't come bigger than him, right? Yeah. 11 championships. Who's, you know, the greatest coach of all time. So you bring this guy in. Now, all of a sudden, James Dolan starts going out on tour. He's not around the city. Mm. You know, he's been out of it for the last couple of years. And you look at his touring schedule, that's how you know he hasn't been meddling with the team. Um, and that's his so that's, touring schedule. Yeah, it's, it's sad that that's what it is. But so that was, you know, that's your hope is you can find somebody who's so who's got such a stature that that Dolan will back off and that person can run the team. Unfortunately, uh, Phil Jackson turned out to be semi insane, uh, you know, like burnout. Who is like obsessed with the triangle, which we all knew, but I, nobody knew to what extent. But, you know, that's like the hope is you could find somebody who can get Dolan to back off, still write checks, and can run the team in a competent fashion. It's weird that he had such a bad concept of how to lead a franchise because he was what, who, leading men as Phil a basketball team. Phil no, Phil. Yeah. Because he was in charge of the Bulls and then the Lakers and was Are we over... sure he wasn't insane the whole time and we just didn't know? Or he got more and more insane as it went yeah. along? I mean, remember that thing in 2000 with the Kings when he like had a, a pump up film for the before the Lakers King series. He had a, like a pump up film cut together that that compared Rick Adelman to Hitler, 
and did Jason Williams to uh, to American History X. You remember this? I don't remember that. Yeah, that and sounds it, a little. It Phil was like Jackson-y. a semi. It was like a semi controversy at the time. Not really because it was Phil Jackson and it was like kind of pre internet, but he was always kind of a wild dude. Mm. All right, let's let's do a couple mailbag questions because the playoffs is going on. Yeah, and this is a fun playoffs. Simon in Toronto asks, all this MVP talk is cute, <laughs> but are the Warriors about to unleash holy hell in the playoffs and go 16 and 0? You heard it here first. So mm. I, I wish I had had a platform. It's too bad. I don't have a column and a podcast where I could have said this <laughs> or Chris Vernon's podcast where I forgot sure. to make this point. It is possible. They at least go eight. No, I mean, Durant yeah. got hurt and I think. Without Durant, there's a chance Portland might stay one of those games. But round two, I think they they're gonna sleep the Clippers or or the Utah. But you could see the, uh, uh, you know, I would say there's a real chance they're eight no going into round three. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, obviously, the Durant injury throws some uncertainty into it. But they're just so good. They're so good. What was scary about game one is Portland throws their best haymaker at yeah. them, right? They're two just huge like, games. Two huge games at the same time from the yeah. two guys they needed. And in the fourth quarter, the Warriors are up 15. It's like, all right, we have no plan B. Like yeah. our plan A was these guys scoring 80 points together. And that's not happening. Could you see a scenario? So the Houston recipe, mm-hmm. and I don't think Houston is better than Golden State. No. They get two monster Harding games. Yep. And they get two games where just everybody makes threes. Right. That's the only way. They'd ha- it would have to be a seven-game win. Two for Harden, two for they go 25 for 48 from three. It's conceivable. I'm it's not conceivable. saying it'll happen, I mean, but it's, it's conceivable. It's conceivable. I mean, there's going to be at least one game where they go crazy from three. Yeah. If you stretch that to two, there's a yeah. chance. But I just don't see it. I mean, like, Draymond has been, like, ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and you just throw him on whoever guy. He just smothers people. Is he put him on hard? He's not the best blocker, shot blocker, but he's the most fun shot blocker. He's got the biggest balls. I mean, like, he blocked two shots in that last game, that two junk dunk attempts in that last game that would have been dunk of the year because it was yeah. him. And yeah. he just, you know, it, it's amazing. Huge balls. Mike from New Jersey says, my friends and I play a game at the end of every regular season where each playoff team seated one through 16 gets to draft a single player from a non-playoff team. Would Anthony Davis be the first pick? I think unquestionably, yes. Yeah. Who's the second pick? Oh, this is good. Second Mm. pick. Guy who did not make the playoffs. Oof. It's a tough one. It is tough. I'm trying to go through all the teams. I would say Towns. Towns is kind of out of his mind. I, if you wanted a win, a wing guy, maybe Wiggins. Ah, I'd go Towns still. You know, it, it, Towns depends on what your team needs. Yeah. Uh, from Andrew in Oklahoma, Paul George's future question. Ooh. Do the Lakers even have anyone that can be as good as Miles Turner? <laughs> the answer is no. The Lakers do not have a guarantee. I like Julius future- Randle, kind of. Would you rather have Miles Turner or I'd Julius rather have Miles Re- I'd rather have Miles, but I like I like Julius. He's like a wrecking ball man. You know, he's like a very, very poor man's like Blake Griffin cross with Draymond Green. I like Miles Turner too. Yeah. Do you think Paul George took enough shit for being a terrible teammate in <laughs> game, after game one? I was actually, I was stunned, A, that he showed CJ Miles up on the court after the miss. Like he just acted like a dick. And then after the game. He, he apologized a little bit. He apologized two days later. Yeah, that's still I've got to take that shot. Yeah, but how many guys in history? I I'm not excusing him, and I agree with you. At the same time, like, uh, how many guys in history would say the same? Have said the same thing? That's like the Kobe movie. What has Paul George done in his career? Uh, yeah, he made he battled Miami in the Eastern Conference Finals as yeah, the best player on a team once. It's also like one of those things where you like they pump these guys up like it's your team, it's your team, you elite, and then at the end you got to get that shot. Yeah, big they mistake like by CJ Miles not throwing the ball back to Paul George. Yeah, three seconds him. left on the shot. That's why clock. you put it on him. CJ Miles is a good offensive player. I agree, it was a good Shoot shot. The ball. If the this is from Darren in Durham, North Carolina, if the Knicks could get rid of either Phil huh. Jackson or Carmelo right now, Ooh. but had to keep the other for the rest of their contract, Phil. who would you pick? Phil. You'd get rid of Phil. Yes. I mean, listen, you know what you're going to get in Melo. You're going to get a uh, guy who clutches the ball a little too much and uh, is an elite scorer at times and doesn't really defend, but will get you 23 to 25 points a game. 
You know, like he's a known entity and you can work around that. And Phil Jackson, I don't know what this guy is going to do next. He's it's it's like having an aging parent who's starting to lose it a little bit. <laughs> you, you think you show up at the house and he's just outside not wearing pants. It's like, Dad, you're in the front line. You don't have pants on. <laughs> hey, uh, from Chris in Phoenix. Are we sure Giannis has the right nickname? Why aren't we calling him Greek God? Because Greek freak rhymes and, and rhyming is is uh is great. I think it's evolved to the freak. You think? It's like professional wrestling. <laughs> where you start out with your nickname and then and then you, you hit a point where the next nickname comes from that nickname. Right. So he, he was Greek freak, but now I think he's just freak. I give him Zeus. This is really important. This is when, probably the most important thing I've ever asked you. From Mark. I didn't put a city down for some reason. Paul Pierce has always looked like he's followed the Krispy Kreme light diet. He's probably uh, the kind of guy who shows up to a family dinner and jogging pants for the extra stretch. He has legit boobies in the player Tribune no. video he did with KG. Not quite D out <laughs> level, but as Pierce heads to retirement, how much weight gained in the first four years of retirement do you pick for one of the all-time great Celtics? Does he go full Ben Stiller at the end of dodgeball and never see his penis again like Charles Barkley? Great question. Let, let me explain uh, to your listeners that there's a, there's a disease called RFD, round face disease. Mm. And no matter how chiseled a guy is, if he has a round face, he always kind of looks out of shape. And I think Paul has suffered from this for most of his career. Mello is another guy. Yeah. RFD, Eric Gordon, Markel Fultz could be round the face. could be the greatest round face disease <laughs> sufferer of all time. If you have that round face, okay. there's nothing you can do. You will always look out of shape. And I think Paul, while he is slightly he's out of shape now, there's no question. I think he's un been unfairly maligned throughout his career because of the shape of his face. Okay. Yeah. When do you have to go? Two minutes? Yeah, pretty much right. now. Last question. Yep. Is Lance Stevenson to the Pacers as Vin <laughs> Diesel is to Fast and Furious? No, come on. Where man. if you take him out of the franchise, no. Pacers slash Fast Furious, he's mortal. You, he's forgettable. Uh, but you give him the uniform, you give him the Fast and Furious franchise, all of a sudden he's an A-lister. I, it's, it's no, because Vin is so integral to the Fast series that it's, it's not a comparison. Vin is the lifeblood of that series. This is why I, I'm Team Vin in the Rock Vin uh, your team Vin. Yeah, because it's this is his, this is Vin's house. He built this. He built this thing. You can't come in here and feud with a guy who built this franchise. That'd be like me coming in here and being like, hey, "Bill's got to go." Ringer, it's like you know. What's I'd be he like, doing? Jason, it's about family. Salute me, <laughs> familiar. There's there's a guy here, and I'm not gonna name names, but he's causing <laughs> problems here at the Ringer, and uh, you know he's not a man. Yeah, I'm Team Vin too. Yeah, settle down, Rock. Yeah, settle down. All right, Jason Concepcion. You're going, I, we can't, you're, you're working on a secret project podcast that <laughs> we can't right. talk about, we but we should mention yeah. Achievement Oriented, our video game podcast that you host with Ben Lindbergh. That's right. Uh, which you can find, subscribe, wherever it is. And that's, the gamers love that one, huh? I hope so. Shouts to my guy, Ben. Yeah. All right. Thanks, buddy. Thanks. One more quick break to talk about SoFi. If you've worked hard to get the career you want, SoFi is here to offer easy savings on the student loans that help get you there. If you've taken out student loans to invest in yourself and your career, SoFi wants to help out. Attending college, following your passions is an investment, but with student debt, it can be quite the burden. SoFi is in the business of helping you pay off student debt faster. And as the leader in student loan refinancing, SoFi refinances federal and private student loans to save its members an average of 22359 total for an average monthly savings of about $288, depending on your eligibility. SoFi pays off all your existing student loans. It gives you one new loan with a lower interest rate. No origination fees, no catch. Whole application process, fast and easy, can be done online. SoFi support team, a phone call away if needed. They want to help you focus less on debt and more on the future. And you get a $100 welcome bonus when you refinance at SoFi.com slash BS. That's S-O-F-I dot com slash BS. Terms and conditions apply. See SoFi.com slash legal. Loans originated by SoFi Lending Corp, California Finance Lender Law License Number 605-4612, NMLS ID 1121636. All right, Jason had to go. Tate Frazier here. What's yep. happening, Tate Frazier? How's it going? I went to the Clipper game last night. I yep. want to talk about the West really quick. 
You watch the Quipper game because I saw you tweeting. Of course. You do the passive aggressive Quipper tweets. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I don't know. You take shots. <laughs> no, you I hate like the... Chris Paul. No, I don't. I don't hate Chris Paul. Hey, you I like making pr- fun of him. I do like making fun of him, but I was proud of him last night. You're proud of him, okay? Yeah, yeah they cut. They cut the game to three. The Jazz did. Yeah. And then Chris Paul comes down, pulls up, hits a three, stretches the lead out, gets the crowd back into it. I was yeah. very proud of him. I uh, I took my daughter to the game. She spends most of the time asking me why DeAndre Jordan isn't like the greatest player in the history of basketball. Because if you don't know that much about basketball and you watch and you just the rebounds and the alley oops and he just seems completely unstoppable. And how massive he is. Yeah. He's huge. Yeah. I, I don't so I so the Clippers Utah's guarding Blake with Boris Diaw mm-hmm. and with Joe Johnson. Yeah. And the Clippers just weren't giving the ball to Blake every time. Yeah. I thought that was strange. And I don't know whether he's hurt, whether he doesn't have confidence, whether Chris Paul is freezing him out. Mm-hmm. Whatever. But, like He had Joe Johnson on him for long stretches of time. And there's a point in that second half where, where the guy two rows behind me is going, this is it. Like the, the Clippers, this might be the last game of all these guys. And you know, everyone's like, if they lose this game, they're going to get swept. Yeah. This might be it. We could be saying goodbye to these guys. The lack of urgency and the lack of let's go to Blake Griffin, I was kind of stunned by. Did you see that watching TV? Yeah, well, I saw there were a couple times when DeAndre was going to inbound the ball, and yeah. Blake wanted to inbound it, and they both were arguing with each other. And then Chris had to be like the dad of the two. It was like one of you guys just inbound it, so they were getting mad at each other, which was great. But I just thought it was incredible the Clippers' first wire-to-wire victory. I couldn't believe they didn't go down in that whole game. Yeah, that they didn't have that one weird Clipper stretch. Yeah, where they just get down by five and then they come back. The the Utah missed a couple shots. This is why I think they're going to win the series pretty easily, actually, even no matter when Gobert comes back. But they just missed shots that had they gone in, the series flips or the game flips, the crowd gets nervous. Mm -hmm. I don't think either of these teams has a chance to hang with Golden State in any significant way. Yeah. And for the Clippers, you know, Doc comes out and he says, um, you know, this, we of course we got to keep this group together. This yeah, is we're like not Utah. blowing it up. Yeah, no, this is like Malone and Stockton. They took took them years to make the finals, and it's like the, technically that's true. Mm-hmm. But Malone and Stockton made the finals those two straight years with probably two of the worst teams they had. <laughs> yeah, and the league was just worse. it watered down. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. had. I don't. Who was the third best guy in that team? Like Antoine Carr, Greg Ostertag, Brian Russell. <laughs> You know, yeah. Horn. I guess it was Hornacek, but their t- the teams in the late eighties, early nineties were just better. But mm-hmm. the league was better. The league got worse. Utah kind of rose to the top. Doesn't mean that, you know. I don't. That's not going to happen with the Clippers. The league's getting better. Yeah. So I don't know. Let's disagree on something. Okay. What What have you heard me say about the basketball playoffs that you disagree with the most? I think the Clippers are going to take the Warriors to seven. Really? Yeah. What? Give me the give me the reason. I think that their continuity wins all in basketball, and I think the Clippers actually have the the team that's it, unfortunately so they're the most like the continuity on that roster is insane. They all know each other really well. I think the one problem they have is Redick is just so bad on defense right now they can't hide him anywhere. But I think Chris Paul is taking it to another level. I think Chris Paul may be if they have a series against the Warriors, he may decide he's the best player in the series. He looked really good last night and has this energy about him the whole game. That's kind of, especially when you're there in person. It's really fascinating. Like there was one time he came off the court. You know that one Clipper assistant who always dresses like in the yeah in the, the nice full, sweaters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy he's like a young guy. He almost <laughs> looks like he's an intern, but he's been there ten years. And he's yeah. I don't know what that guy's name is. They just started screaming at each other mm-hmm. coming off the court. And the guy was like, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. And then they had to pull the guy away. Everyone's Chris like, Paul doesn't need help. Yeah, Chris Paul's like, get away from me. He's just, he's so mad. He's just stomping around. Yeah. And I think those guys, they love playing with them, but they also hate playing with them. What? It's a weird energy. I kind of just, I'm just, I based this on the super team theory of like the first year it never works out because if it did, it would just be too easy. Yeah. So say the Warriors, something bad happens. Maybe Durant doesn't come back fully healthy. Maybe they don't know who the guy is down the stretch. The Clippers deal like if Chris Paul does the Dirk thing and he gets his one championship to validate everything else in his career. Yeah. That's, that's my, that's why I have the Clippers. That's why I just believe they could do it. But then I'm like, then I watch the Clippers and I'm like, oh, there's no way that this will happen. But I believe. Blake was definitely more athletic 
and more confident two years ago yeah. during that Spurs series. Like the, he does this thing. I, I think he's hurt. I think it's going to come out after the series that he's got something wrong with him. Yeah. Or after the playoffs. But there's this thing. I don't totally understand it. Just the thing where he just lurches into guys. When he fall, when he like falls just goes back. He's flying yeah. into guys. He's yeah. just trying to get contact. and But it's not. There's no grace to it. And I felt like in the San Antonio series he had an element of grace with what he was doing with the spin mm -hmm. moves and the footwork. And now he's just kind of barreling into the paint. Yeah. And I don't know what happened. I don't know if it's rust or lack of confidence or injuries or he's breaking down physically or what, but he's not the same guy. He's the only guy outside of the YMCA's across the country that goes straight back and falls into the basket on people. Like, and then no, just like, like, like a kid. He's like yeah. a kid. He just falls back into the basket into people. It's so strange. Even DeAndre does it, but he does like the backwards dunk. It's yeah. just so awkward sometimes. My favorite thing about the Clippers is that Luke and Bamute will not drive to the basket. Joe Ingles drew a charge last night by setting back at the three-point line, and Luke Mbamute drove back. It was the first charge I've ever seen someone take a charge driving away from the basket. That's how bad Luke Mbamute does not but want to yet, go to the but, basket. But yet he had a couple backdoor layups because they were yeah. just not even acknowledging him. <laughs> it's like, all right, I'll, He's I'll like, take I'll your up. <laughs> free backdoor layup. Yeah. What do you think happens in Houston OKC? Okay, because I tweeted my prediction yesterday that I think Patrick Beverly could foul out in three minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So here, here's the thing. And it's not a Westbrook thing. It's not like, oh, you hate Westbrook. It's like, this is how the NBA works. Yep. They have three or four players that they're going to take care of. Houston was physical with Westbrook in game one. Mm -hmm. What happens is the league looks at that and they say, this is too physical. Like, you got to, if they're going to do this, this, and this, you got to call that. Yep. Houston doesn't adjust. They're, they're playing by the game one rules. Game two happens. The refs are calling touch fouls. Westbrook has more leeway. And momentum goes. And all of a sudden, he's at the free throw line 22 times. I think that's how tonight plays out. I could, Yeah, that definitely checks out. I kind of have a feeling, a sneaking suspicion that people are going to turn on the Thunder. Like, they'll be down 2-0. People will be like, oh, they're no good. They may get swept. And then Russ has like a 50-point game three. So maybe then, that's the way he gets every call. And then everyone flips back that yeah. way. And like, oh, this is a home-and-home -home type series. But then... I don't know. I just think the Rockets are better. It, I think they're definitely better. I think it'd be terrible for the NBA if if Russ didn't win a game. If he gets swept, if they got swept and then he wins the MVP, that's just awkward. I mean, not as awkward as Nowitzki winning the MVP after he lost as a one seed <laughs> in uh, two thousand seven. Yeah, two thousand seven. Um, yeah. So I would say, from what I've seen, I think he. I disagree. I think Houston is the only team that has a chance to hang with Golden State just because of the threes. I think Golden yeah. State's too good. But then you go to the East. It's like Milwaukee, Toronto should just win that game by 15 points yesterday. Milwaukee won their game. Usually how the NBA goes is you win the game one. Game two, the home team takes care of business. And it, Milwaukee almost won game two. It was yeah. tied with two minutes left. I watched it this morning. I was like, gee, I, Jesus. Like they, they had that game. Yeah, when Giannis hit the three to tie yeah. the game with two minutes left, that was unbelievable. And Giannis is unstoppable. I think yeah. he's clearly the second best player in the East can make a K it's like what's weird is Isaiah I mean we don't know how much all this stuff's affecting him he hasn't played like one of the top three guys in the East but yeah I think going into the playoffs you I voted for him second team on NBA mm -hmm. you would have said LeBron Isaiah Isaiah and yeah oh I voted Giannis for second team on NBA too I guess Giannis was the second best but now he's, he's a guy clearly yeah, yeah 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 you don't even I, I don't think anyone wants to play I think the Raptors kind of got a raw deal having to play the Bucks in that first round series. oh yeah especially with when he threw that alley to Maker to Thon Maker and they had the Giannis to Thon that's a scary sight it kind of it reminded me of 2013 with the Warriors you're like this team's gonna be really good this might not be the year where that they do it yeah but they're gonna push someone like when they push the Spurs to six games it was like oh they're a serious contender in the future it might not be this year maybe, maybe the Raptors win in seven. But the next year and then the next year, it's like the Bucks are basically a look like they could be a dynasty with all those guys. I know if you add Jabari to it too, just even yeah, as a Jabari's score off the bench. There. Yeah. The, even if you if he's twenty five minutes a game off the bench as their second the leader of their second unit or something. And I forget some of the like I don't talk about John Henson enough with that team. Like they have a huge guy that's six eleven with a seven foot four wingspan to block the rim. They have everything that you need and to And Monroe. Good they yeah. can just throw this random Greg Monroe post up wrinkle and he'll go get buckets for three minutes. The Cavs would kill to have Greg Monroe. The to Celtics throw into would a kill to have Greg Monroe. I don't yeah. know why they didn't trade for him. I Thonmaker hasn't looked this good since the two thousand five McDonald's All American <laughs> game. 
which I thought he was great in that game. <laughs> which I think it was with who was in that game? Brandon Roy. I can't remember who, but yeah, yeah they they were just year. hooking up. Yeah. Oh, it's him and Durant. Maybe it's 2006. 2006. It was it's a him Durant, and Durant yeah. and Odin. Yeah, Brandon Wright. Thought Maker. I think he had a double double. It was a huge game. It was really good. Was Milwaukee big... is definitely. They've won the internet in round one. I think. Right. Def, I Who's mean, won the internet so far? Milwaukee. Everyone's on Giannis. Rock, now. Playoff Rondo. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy Butler to some degree. Mm, yeah. Um, the Portland guards. Yeah. That was really fun. Draymond. Yeah. Um, not, Patrick Beverly. Not Oladipo. <laughs> not Oladipo. <laughs> He's definitely lost a lot. That was of, bad. Yeah. yeah. That was, it was a one for 12, I think. Yeah. But that's the thing. It's like, you get to the playoffs, it's a different level. It's different level intensity. And all your warts get exposed. Mm-hmm. You know, like the Bulls are just like, Marcus Smart, shoot take it shoot keep shooting threes we, we're gonna leave you right there we dare you to shoot and it's like what do you do he's a 30 yeah. percent three-point shooter who thinks he's a great three-point shooter he's streaky. spot up threes yeah when he got the steal and and brought it out to the three-point line and took that three yeah. rather than resetting and resetting the offense i thought steven's gonna have a kinism on the sideline the worst was when the the Celts were trying to come back against the bulls they got a basket i think they're down six and crowder just took two terrible threes in traffic but yeah. they have a lot of guys who think they're better three-point shooters than they are uh so washington to me is the big winner in this whole thing yeah they end up in the four spot they mm-hmm. don't have to play toronto or cleveland yep now they're gonna uh, they're gonna play this celtics team that's in a free fall mm-hmm. that even if they came back would seem vulnerable or this bulls team that was a mess three weeks ago yeah they would have home court advantage against the Bulls. Mm-hmm. They'd have a huge speed advantage with Wall against Rondo. Yeah. And, you know, Barkley was saying from day one it was going to be Cleveland, Washington. I I still think Toronto's going to be heard from. I just, I like their team and how flexible they are. I think this Milwaukee matchup's just weird. It's a but bad draw for them bad in the first, draw. for the first round. It's crazy. Do you like Washington, though? I do. I like John I Wall. I do too. I think that. John Wall may be the best player. We were just talking about Giannis being the second best player in the East. I can yeah. argue that John Wall is the second best player in the East behind LeBron. Could you say that the East is actually as good as the West this year? It's. I mean, it's fun to watch. This the Warriors is the most are the best fun. team, yeah. but then you go like two through eight versus one through eight, and I would say that the East probably has more interesting teams. I don't know if it's a fatigue with the West teams too. Like obviously we're all fatigued with the Clippers. Like we don't really even appreciate them as much. And then you watch right. the Wizards. It's like, oh, Bradley Bill's so fun. He can hit threes. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, John Wall runs this great offense. He like gets everyone involved. It's like an almost hyper athletic Chris Paul, and he's like more willing to pass than Russell Westbrook, but he's just as athletic. It's yeah. It, like, I like oh, the Otto Porter is fifth in the league in three point yeah. shooting. You got the Morris twin that's like kind of trying to be nice now. It's like, oh, and then his no, brother, his, nice. his brother he's wears. His, did you see his brother wearing his jersey? Yeah, like he yeah, wears yeah. the Wizards jersey. I think yeah. they should swap places in case they're having a bad night. They probably could. That'd be a good rom com. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> NBA players that switch places. Can I yeah. ask you about LeBron? Just the LeBron's averaging the most minutes in the playoffs already. He's yeah. like forty two minutes a game. I think he's he's just a cyborg. I don't understand it. It's got it. There has to be an end to it. You can't. I just don't know how you can play forty-two minutes in the playoffs. I like love. That. People think I'm being sarcastic because I've tweeted a couple of times about how much I love watching this Cavs team. Yeah, I think they're really fun to watch, yeah. and you can't turn the game off because even if they're up fifteen, they still might give up ten points in a row in two minutes because their defense is so bad. All of their games are entertaining. Like they might yep. be involved in eight Hardwood Classic games over the next. I don't know. Two months. I have a theory that they do it on purpose, because it's like it's it's more drama to have them come back. Because they just like they get ahead and then they just sit there for a little while. Channing Fry starts taking shots. Kyrie stops getting the ball. Because Kyrie is like they can just give him the ball to score like six straight points and then he'll just kind of lay That's back. That's the part I don't understand with the Cavs is Kyrie is unstoppable and it seems like you know Lillard has these runs where he's just thirty points a game for yep. two months and. All these other point guards, John Wall has his runs, Westbrook obviously going to Isaiah. Yeah. These guys have their hot months. Why doesn't Ky- Kyrie's just twenty five a night? Where's his month where he's just like, Oh my god, Kyrie. Yeah. He's gone for thirty five a game for four weeks now. Like it, it feels like he could do that any time. It feels like he checks out and then someone has LeBron is like, All right, Kyrie, turn it back on. And then he's like, Okay, I'll go get eight points real quick. And it's like unconscious eight points. It's like the e- it's like unbelievable right. shots, <sighs> easy buckets, and then it's back to Somebody sent me a question about whether Marcus Gray in Jersey. If you were David Griffin and you could redo the summer of 2014, 
would you max out Gordon Hayward, keep Andrew Wiggins, and convince LeBron to play the four for the rest of his career and make that your team with Thompson and Kyrie? It's actually a better team. Oh, way better team. I still think the whole, like, especially if they get rid of Love, there's going to be some sort of concession in like five years from LeBron where he's like, he, he made a mistake for the he panic, he panic traded for him. Yeah. And I think he just looked at the rebounds and was like, what do I need? What did I not have in Miami? I had to do too much rebounding. I didn't carry that low, that low too much. Okay, I'll get Kevin Love to come here and, and rebound for me so I don't have to worry about that. I wrote a column that summer about Love Wiggins before that trade happened about whether they should do it or not. Yeah. And it basically came down to, if you're going to just try to win the title this year, mm -hmm. you do it. But if LeBron's going to be there for eight years and you're trying to build like this next – this uh this basically decade of excellence yeah wiggins was the pick where he'll be you, the veteran make, guy at the end of yeah, it yeah and you and you make wiggins your pippin mm -hmm. wiggins we knew was good defensively yep um although i think he's been a little disappointed in that in minnesota but at least he had the athletic ability to do it lebron basically turns him into his little clone mm -hmm. you know and just kind of shows him the rope and i that might have been made them more dangerous you have Kyrie and, and wiggins as your backcourt for 10 years yeah i wouldn't want to play against that that's... LeBron's now he's his end game now is his son. <laughs> he's recruiting his own. When son, he yeah. trades Kyrie for a son for the pick to pick his son in seven years, the LeBron, topic they do the Ken Griffey senior senior junior thing. I It'll love be that. Fantastic. Uh, all right, we got to wrap this up. So we have uh, two more podcasts coming this week. We taped a podcast yesterday that I'm not sure when we're running yet with uh, Matt and Trey from South Park. That was really good. So keep an eye on that. And we have two more high profile guests coming mm -hmm. this week. So that'll be fun. Thanks again to Proper Cloth. Finding a dress shirt that fits is hard. Ordering a custom fit shirt has never been easier thanks to Proper Cloth. Their custom shirts start from $85. High quality shirts made from premium Italian and Japanese fabrics. They even guarantee a perfect fit. Remakes are free. Stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Start looking your best. Go to propercloth.com slash BS. Enter gift code BS to save $20 on your first shirt. Thanks so much to SeatGeek. Thanks to Jason Concepcion. Don't forget about his achievement-oriented podcast. Don't forget about Tate's GM Street podcast with Mike Lombardi. It's heating up draft time. And uh, and thanks to everybody out there for, for spreading the word for those first 200 podcasts. Really proud of everything we've been able to accomplish on this front. Back later in the week with more. BS podcast. And by the way, I've not given up on the Celtics yet. I just want to go on the record with that. I think they could steal game three. I think Isaiah can get going. I think I don't feel like this series. Tate, am I crazy? Just go to seven. Just win. Just one at a time. Yeah. Win three. Just try to get it back to game five. Down three, one. You win game five. Now you're game six. Bunch of pressure on Chicago. Like it's, it's fine. Yeah. It's okay. The Bulls are not, this is not the 93 Bulls they're playing. They, they should at least be able to throw a couple of haymakers these next, these next few games. Uh, good luck to Isaiah Thomas. Yep. And, uh, and good luck to the Celtics. And we'll see you on the BS Podcast later in the week. <laughs>